And three, two, one. And welcome back. We're here with Dr. Uh, Muhammad Noor. Uh, welcome to uh, our podcast uh, <laughs> interviews. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited. You guys been having fun at Dragon Con so far? Oh, yeah. It's it being Sunday morning, it's like everybody's like, oh, we're yeah, <laughs> energy is yeah, getting low. Yeah, not fair. Uh, so, first off, uh, who are you? What do you do? Like, how, you know, your scientific background to, before we get into your more. Uh... <laughs> sure, sure. So, I'm a professor of biology at Duke University. Um, I'm also currently the interim vice provost for academic affairs, which is, I always like to say, is one of the most generic titles you can have at a university. <laughs> um, in terms of scientific background, um, I have an undergraduate degree in biology, and I have a PhD in ecology and evolution. And I do research in evolutionary genetics, and I also teach classes in both evolution and in genetics. So that's a, that's a more of the scientific <laughs> side of my, of my work. <laughs> Uh, John Hessler here from Geeky Cool with Dr. Muhammad Noor. Hello. And I'm, of course, sitting next to my friends from Cigar Nerds, the podcast that is apparently amazing. Mm-hmm. And I will definitely start tuning into it. What made you want to go into the field of biology? Oh, that's a great question. So as a kid, I always loved the animals. I used to, like, catch wild bugs. I used to love those June bugs we had in Hampton, Virginia. I'd catch those and put them on ice and see if they'd stop moving and put them in the freezer for a while and go release them. <laughs> I just loved like, playing with animals and things like that. I just I loved reading about it. My, my parents are, are, are also from STEM and that they're both engineers. So they would always uh, encourage that sort of behavior too. And my father was in aerospace engineering, so he encouraged a lot of space talk too. So I, I'd get some books. He, he worked not for NASA, but physically at NASA. He would sometimes get me books from there too. So I had this one called On Mars. And this was right after the Viking space missions. And it was fascinating. I had these pictures of Mars. Like, oh my gosh, it's a planet. It's like actual photos from another planet. So that was always really cool. In college, though, what really got me was um, I started taking the introductory biology classes, and those were not actually that interesting. But then my junior year of college, I took a class in genetics. I was like, okay, this is pretty good. I actually put it off because people had said it was hard, but actually I really enjoyed it. I mean, it, was, it was a little challenging, but it actually had a cool logic to it. But then the second semester of junior year, I took this class called evolutionary genetics. Oh, I used to sit in the front row of this class. And just, you know, just loving, like, oh, wow, here's the story. And here's how genetics applies over time to make new species, to make change within species. I used to record the class with my tape recorder, and I'd listen to it later when I was working out. Like, I want to hear it again. <laughs> it was just so cool. <laughs> and that's the best part of sitting down with, like, you know, the passion that, without any scientist we've sat down, like, just the passion for their, their field. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it never gets bored. Even now, I mean, I've been working in this field for you know over thirty years, and I, I love it. It's still so cool. So, uh, kind of one of the reasons you're here at DragonCon is yeah. you do a little uh, science advising for some from some shows we've uh, and movies we've heard about. How did you get into that? Oh, amazing! Actually, there's a DragonCon connection. <laughs> to that. So it's interesting if you go back to when I was in college, right after I took that, uh, or right before I took that genetics class. I remember talking with a professor there, and he said, "What would you like to do?" And I said, "You know, I would love to do." I would love to advise on the science in Star Trek. <laughs> Literally actually said this back in college. This was in 1990 or so, something like that. But um, the way I got into it, well, first I got into coming to conventions because my daughter back in 2014 said, why don't we go to Dragon Con? I'd never even heard of Dragon Con. Why don't we go to Dragon Con? She was into Doctor Who at the time. She saw that Patrick Stewart and other Star Trek people were going to be there. So she's like, I bet Dad would want to come to this. So we did, and we had a blast. And I saw there was a science track and all these other sort of science talks here. It's like, oh, that's pretty cool. So I asked uh, Garrett Wong, who's mm-hmm. the director of the Trek Track here, if I could come and give science talk. And he said, "And he said, absolutely. He said, we love to have more science content. We love to have more of the real science behind what's going on there. So I did the first of those in 2016. And I started giving talks then. And actually, one of the people I was giving talks with sometimes here at DragonCon was Dr. Aaron McDonald, who you might know is, is the primary science advisor for the whole Star Trek universe. She's, I like to say she's the sheriff of science in Star Trek here. <laughs> But in 20, I think it was 18, I guess it, I think it was 2018, either 2018 or 2019, after Star Trek Discovery had come out, we gave a talk together here at DragonCon about science and Star Trek Discovery. Neither of us had any association with the franchise still. And a couple people sat in the back of the, of the room. It was Mary Chifo, Ken Mitchell, and Jane Brooke. So they were, of course, all actors from Star Trek Discovery. Jane, it turns out, had actually gone to Duke University for her undergrad. So she came up afterwards and talked to me and said, hey, I went to Duke, you know, and, and we chatted, and we got to be friends. I even invited her to come out to Duke to talk to my class there. 
But she then connected me with Erica Lippold, who's one of the writers for Star Trek Discovery. Erica connected me to Michelle Paradise, who's a showrunner, and eventually I got to be you know, somebody who could actually consult on starting season three of Star Trek Discovery. What's really fascinating is Dr. Aaron McDonald went through a completely different route, but right around the same time. So when I got the call from Michelle, Par Michelle Paradise saying, we want you to consult on the storyline for season three of Discovery, she said, we want to pair you with this, with this new physicist we just brought on board, Dr. Aaron McDonald, <laughs> who we'd already given talks with together. So it was, it was fantastic. I think we spoke to her a couple years yes. ago. That, yeah, that yeah. It's like, what, um, I understand like, uh, whatever, astrophysicists, mm -hmm. like tech, technology yeah. advisors, Biology is a little Biology, harder. Like yeah. what's, uh... Well, this is one of the reasons I probably would never be the main science advisor for somebody who just gets contracted. So, I mean, obviously, like if you look at something like Star Trek or most of the sci-fi franchises, so much of it is about astrophysics, space travel, all that kind of stuff. But to seek out new life <laughs> is part of the whole thing. And they always encounter these aliens, and there's a lot of questions that come up with them, like, how does this work? They also try to insert sometimes a lot of genetics into these episodes, sometimes not so well. <laughs> and so, the good news is the writers are willing to spend money and spend effort and bring somebody in and actually get it as close to right as possible. So that's where that's where I try to do my best to do it. And I'll tell you, it's actually terrifying because if I make a mistake, <laughs> I will be mocked by the entire community for so long. So I double and triple check even things I'm very, very certain of. I double and triple check all the pieces. But in the end, of course, story will always trump science. So sometimes the science isn't exactly right. Because, you know, if they have to, like, go through the core of a planet and under extreme pressure, they're just going to do it. <laughs> so do you think, being that you're a biologist and a genist, do you think there is life out there someplace? A hundred percent, yeah. <laughs> I would say a hundred percent, rounding off to a hundred percent, not actually hundred percent, but rounding off to a hundred percent, yes. I mean... The universe is so big. I mean, we are such a tiny, tiny little part of it. And to imagine that in all those other worlds, we didn't have that set of things, those set of criteria we associate with life, like, you know, reproduction, evolution, all that kind of stuff. It's just, it's impossible to conceive that that would never have happened anywhere else, at least to me. So you, or do you think that, uh, you know, the kind of our definition of life is based off, you know, kind of Earth biology? Do you think uh, out there there might be something that we wouldn't consider alive, but it's growing up in that different style of environment that doesn't kind of apply to the same earthly laws. Mm -hmm. it, it, we're gonna come into like, you know, rock people or you know, whatever, yeah. you're something that evolved completely I, different. From... I can't overstate how much I love that question. Because I, I have actually said that sentence a hundred times. Yes, I am, I am positive that there will be many things out there that would co constitute life, but that we would never recognize them as alive because we have seen essentially just one instance of life. There's a lot of diversity around that one instance, but it all comes back to one origin. Mechanically at all. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's all connected, right? They're all offspring of the same thing. It's kind of the, the analogy I like to say is imagine that you define the game by having, seen, having played Settlers of Catan and maybe a couple other things. We can toss in Monopoly and Rift. Yeah. Okay, so you define, that's the way you define a game. So how do you define a game? Well, a game is, you know, oh, there's a thing where, you know, one person wins and you have dice and people sit around the table and blah, blah, Okay, what about poker? What about hacky sack? What about, <laughs> what about, you know, lacrosse? None of those would fit the definition that we call a game if you'd only ever seen that little subset of kind of related games. I'm sure that's true with, with life. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, the one thing I liked was, and going back into Star Trek, mm -hmm. you know, with the whole original series, they basically made everybody look pretty much similar. Yeah. And then when you got to the first movie, and they did, they had Viger take over the one character, and then she she called us the carbon-based units. Yeah. And I thought that was kind of cool because they finally broke it down yeah. to a way that we would be defined as something yeah. by something that was supposedly technologically superior to us. Yeah. And it broke us down into a form that we could still understand. Totally, totally. It's analogous to what you just said. If you go to the first season of Next Generation, remember ugly bags of mostly water. <laughs> right? It's the same kind of thing. Actually, in the original series, they did actually have a couple of exceptions, too, like the Horda, where something was not actually carbon-based, but a silicon-based. So they, did, they were thinking broadly, but they rarely did that. It was mostly people with prosthetics, which of course was just to meet the, the financial need, <laughs> requirements of making such an episode. Yeah, it seems like as budget has gone up, yes. so has like, you know, the, the 
you know, the de attention to detail. Uh, totally. Look at a species 10C in Star Trek Discovery. Like, yeah. wow, that is like truly alien life. And that was one that, that uh, thankfully, they actually brought me in to consult with, too. It was so fun when you know, we got this call and Michelle Carey said, we want to have truly alien aliens. We want them to communicate in some way that is not something the Universal Translator can just spit out the answer to, but there's going to have to be this long, iterative process associated with it. So that was fantastic to get to work on that. So is there anything outside the project that you've worked on that you're like, all right, Hollywood got that right? Is it for for uh, you know fans of uh, yeah. biology and genetics that are like, all right, if you watch this movie, you're not going to be annoyed. Uh, <laughs> okay, so it's, well, I, was, I started to say The Martian, but there's not that much biology and genetics in it. But if you're thinking specifically biology and genetics, one one series I like pretty well is Orphan Black. Hmm. It's kind of enough you guys have watched that. I mean, some of it, yeah, some yeah, of it, yeah. The clones. I mean, yeah, it's it's interesting. Like they must have some science advisors in there because like they'll mention like specific genes in there. Like whoa, you guys like did a deep dive to pull that out. Okay, <laughs> beyond Google for <laughs> definitely beyond Google. <laughs> so I mean, it's not perfect because again, always story will trump science, yeah. but it's pretty good overall.